Hello, I'm Patsy Ramsey. Daddy's not here, but this is Jean Bonnet. She's four, Burke is seven, and we'd like to welcome you to our home and wish you a very Merry Christmas. One taught me love, one taught me patience, and one taught me pain. All of them dicked over by their parents. Allegedly. Hello and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Tom Harlock and I do not have an intro, but I do have a passion for falling into holes. The deeper, the better. And you can't talk about gaping holes without mentioning John Benet Ramsey. Boulder, Colorado's reigning pageant queen, John Benet Ramsey, was six years old in 1996 when she celebrated Christmas with her family. Her brother Burke, her mother Patsy, and her father John. The family loved Christmas and their home was always decorated to show home standards. And that's not hyperbole, Patsy would literally open her doors and do tours of the Christmas decorations to the neighbours. <laughs> it's very Caucasian, but they like to go all out for the sake of memories. 1994. What'd you get, Jabonet? Yes, oh. However, Christmas in 96 would be remembered for all the wrong reasons, because on the 26th of December, Patsy Ramsey woke up and discovered her daughter missing. Hours later, she would be discovered dead. The death of John Bonnet Ramsey was the birth of one of the most bizarre unsolved crimes in American history, and it would go on to perplex detectives, the world, and more importantly, me, for 20 years. I have always loved this case, but recently I have dialed up my interest to a potentially unhealthy and probably criminal amount. Today, I'm gonna tell you what we know happened, what could have happened, and why, 20 years later, this crime goes unsolved and no one's been convicted despite the fact that somebody has confessed. This video is highly requested after the one I made on Madeleine McCann, so please let me know your theories and your thoughts down below in the comments. Also, this video is sponsored by the honestly revolutionary people over at Honey. I'm that guy who truly refuses to pay for anything full price. I love discount codes and vouchers. And so when I heard about Honey and what they do, I was taken aback. Honey is an online shopping tool that automatically searches for the best discount codes, helping to save you a ton of money and you can accrue honey gold which can then be converted into vouchers to be used at your favorite stores. I tested honey when I bought my Timberland boots and I saved £35. It takes two clicks to install and start saving money so to try it yourself visit joinhoney.com slash harlock. Again that's joinhoney.com slash harlock to save money on stores that you're already using such as ASOS, Domino's, Macy's. Honey's 10 million members on average save around $28 a month. So to do that for free on sites that you're already using, click the link in my description. Again, thank you so much to Honey for sponsoring and let's get on with the video. John Bonet Ramsey, specifically the mystery surrounding her death, was the perfect news story and the media lapped it up. And seeing as John Bonet was a 24 time winner pageant star, there were no shortage of photos for the media to use. Born in the summer of 1990 in Atlanta, Georgia, John Bonet's name was a poor man to her father. John Bennett, and her middle name was Patricia after her mother. Her brother Burke, born in 87, was three years older than John Bonet. She was six whilst he was nine. After having three children, Melinda, Beth, and John Andrew with his first wife, Lucinda, the couple divorced in 78. Two years later, John would marry Patsy. Patricia Poe, born in 56, was 23 years old when she married John. After attending the West Virginia University, she graduated with a bachelor's degree in marketing and advertising. She was Pretty good at it. Patsy, much like her daughter John Bonet, was no stranger to the pageant scene, having won Miss West Virginia in 1977. Three years later, her sister would win the same title. After graduating, Patsy moved to Atlanta, where she would meet John. After having her two children, the family would be complete. John was a successful businessman. In short, he would buy and sell computer parts and formed a company called Access Graphics. Access Graphics did amazingly well and John sold the company in 91 to Lockheed Martin, a huge technology company that also manufactures war weapons. A year after the sale, John's daughter Beth, age 22 and a flight attendant, would die on the freeway in an accident after leaving an art gallery. Despite the tragedy, the sale did make the Ramseys multi-millionaires and they acted like it. They had private jets, they had boats, they also had two homes, a mansion in Boulder, Colorado and the holiday home in Michigan on the lake. The family were in the mansion on the 23rd of December 1996. In fact, they were having a party. The 30 friends and family in attendance could easily fit inside the house. It was four stories and 15 rooms. It was a very big house. The party was going as parties do until a police officer knocked on the door of 755 15th Street. A lady answered, reportedly Susan 
Stein. The police officer was responding to a 911 call placed from inside the address. However, they were turned away by Susan. It was an accident. Someone must have pocket dialed or I don't think you had pocket phones in the 90s, but lent against the wall. Two days later, it was time for Christmas. Christmas morning saw John Bonet, her brother Burke, Father John and Mother Patsy opening Christmas presents in their pyjamas. They ate their traditional Christmas breakfast of pancakes, hash browns and bacon. Burke played with his new train set whilst John Bonet rode her new bike. It was a little bit too big for her, but her parents assumed she'd grow into it. These photos of John Bonet were the last taken of her alive. The Ramsey family spent Christmas afternoon at their neighbours and friends, the Whites. Fleet and Priscilla. Arriving at 5.30, they exchanged gifts and had something to eat, and at 8.30, the Ramseys left, stopping at neighbours on the way to deliver gift baskets. According to John and Patsy, the family arrived home at 10pm, where John Bonnier was fast asleep in the back of the car. The family were due to travel to Michigan the next day, so they had suitcases by the front door ready to leave. John passed these suitcases, carrying John Bonnet asleep from the car to her bedroom on the second floor. Patsy then tied up John Bonnet's hair and tucked her in, ready for bed. The rest of the family followed suit. It was Christmas Day after all, and most people who celebrate Christmas would find it pretty exhausting, including Melody Stanton. Melody was asleep, as most are, at 2am when she was awoken. A child was screaming. Lasting for a couple of seconds, the scream startled Melody enough to wake up her husband sleeping next to her. They stayed awake for a while, listening out for anything. They heard nothing, other than the sound of metal clanging against concrete. Assuming a sleeping child nearby had a nightmare, the couple went back to sleep. Early morning, at around 5.30, Patsy woke up to the sound of John showering. Patsy then redressed in the clothes that she wore the previous day to the White's party, a red turtleneck and black velvet trousers. She then went downstairs to make some coffee via the spiral staircase. At 5.52 that morning, a call was placed from the Ramsey house, using the phone attached to the wall by the kitchen. Here's the recording. 911 emergency. <laughs> Patsy Ramsey did not make her coffee that morning. In fact, the morning of the 26th of December, 1996, would be unlike any other. Whilst walking down the spiral staircase, towards the bottom, Patsy would step over three pieces of paper laid out on one of the steps. Positioning herself to be able to read, Patsy soon understood the note for what it was, a ransom note. She screamed on the spot, alerting John upstairs. And let me read this note to you. Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We respect your business, but not the country it serves. At this time, we have your daughter in our possession. She is safe and unharmed, and if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. You will withdraw $118,000 from your account. $100,000 will be in $100 bills and the remaining $18,000 in $20 bills. Make sure that you bring an adequate sized attaché to the bank. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on delivery. The delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. If we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery of the money and hence an earlier pickup of your daughter. Any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. You will also be denied her remains for a proper burial. The two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you, so I advise you not to provoke them. Speaking to anyone about your situation, such as the police or FBI, will result in your daughter being beheaded. If we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies. If you alert the bank authorities, she dies. 
if the money is in any way marked or tampered with, she dies. You can try to deceive us, but be warned we are familiar with law enforcement's countermeasures and tactics. You stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. Follow our instructions and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. You and your family are under constant scrutiny as well as the authorities. Don't try and grow a brain, John. You are not the only fat cat around, so do not think that killing will be difficult. Don't underestimate us, John. Use that good southern common sense of yours. It's up to you now, John. Victory. SBTC. If you're thinking, that's a pretty detailed ransom note, you would be correct. 354 words to be exact. The longest ransom note recorded in American criminal history. Most notes aren't more than 50 words, but we'll talk more about the ransom note later. After checking that Burke was okay and he was, more phone calls were made. This time to their friends, the Whites, Fleet and Priscilla, and the Fernies, Barbara and John. Seven minutes after the original 911 call, officers arrived on the scene. It was the day after Christmas, so the Boulder Police Department was spread a little bit thin. In America, there are 50 homicides a day. That's about 20,000 a year. I looked it up, and in Boulder, Colorado, there had only been a reported 21 in the last 15 years. Before John Bonet, I could only find one other unsolved homicide in Boulder, Colorado. In 87, a 22-year-old man called Sid Wells was shot to death. Maybe this is why Boulder Police Department was seemingly unprepared to tackle the events of that day, and what was to come. The Boulder Police Department tapped the phones and they assigned a detective, Linda Arndt, and they made a couple shitty soft searches of the house. Nothing major, they were looking for entry and exit points. A victim's advocate group also arrived to make breakfast for the Ramseys. Their job was to keep things normal, keep the flow of the house going even though their child had been robbed. I don't really understand the point of that. By the time that Burke had been taken to the White House and the $118,000 ransom had been collected, it was 8 a.m. All that was left to do apparently was wait for the author of the ransom note to call. But by 8.30, there was still no call. By nine, then the phone hadn't rang. 9.30 a.m., still no call. By the time that 10 a.m. arrives and nobody bats an eyelid, Detective Arndt feels something isn't right with the situation. Nobody said it's 10 o'clock and the kidnappers haven't called? Nobody said that. Was that something else you took note of? Absolutely. If I've been told to just sit and wait for a phone call between 8 and 10 to hear about my daughter and her abduction, if 10 o'clock comes and goes, then I'm gonna know about it and everyone else in the house is gonna know about it. John Ramsey just continued with his day as normal. He opened his mail. I made a note that he was looking at his mail and then I wondered, where did your mail come from? And he organized a public relations team and a lawyer. And he also got on the phone to his pilot and asked them to arrange a flight out for him and his family. They wanted to leave Colorado and go to Michigan. The police had to pull him to the sides and say, John, that's not happening. I'm sorry, but you're not going anywhere. By the early afternoon, there was still no call from this abductor and the Ramsey house was this calm frenzy. John Bonet's room is finally treated like a crime scene and taped off. And in an effort to retain some normality, the victim's advocate group started cleaning the kitchen up. Okay. Detective Arn is requesting backup from her superiors. She is struggling to contain the situation by herself. She hasn't much experience. Patsy was slumped in a chair and John was sat still too. The tension, I suppose, simmers and is just too much for everyone to handle because Detective Linda Arndt turns around to Father John Ramsey and Fleet White and asks them to do a search of the house from top to bottom to check for anything that seems out of place. The house has been looked over, like I said, a couple of times in search of entry and exit points. There were no signs of forced entry, but there were definitely some security errors. Two windows were open to allow for Christmas lights to lead out of the house. Another, one leading down to the basement, was completely smashed although it was covered with a grate. Security lights were out and the security system, the home alarm system the Ramseys had, just was not set up. Mr. Ramsey and Fleet White seemingly interpreted Detective Arndt's instructions of top to bottom as bottom to top. They started with the basement and the Ramsey's house is split over four floors. Basement on the bottom level, the first floor is where the kitchen is, the second floor, John Bonet's bedroom and Burke's, and the third floor is purely the parents' bedroom. It's a giant attic with two stairs leading down. It doesn't seem like the easiest of buildings to navigate without prior knowledge. John led the way as they left the kitchen, down the stairs into the basement and into the boiler room. Going through the boiler room is the only way of accessing the wine cellar, which is where John led Fleet first. This area had been checked by law enforcement, but they couldn't see everything. They 
didn't know where the light switch was. But John Ramsey knew. He flicked the switch to the wine cellar and screamed. For lying on the floor, mouth taped, hands bound and neck tied, was his daughter John Binet. She was wearing a top with a silver star and a cross around her neck. Cause of death, according to the autopsy, was asphyxia by strangulation associated with craniocerebral damage. Blood force trauma. However, when Emmy John Mayer arrived, he did not find John Bernay in the basement like her father had. When John Ramsey found his daughter, he screamed out, My baby, which I can only assume is an appropriate response to finding a dead child. And I know I have little experience in this. However, what he did next doesn't seem so appropriate. Upon finding his abducted daughter, John removed the tape from her mouth and carried her upstairs. And according to science that I had to learn, she would have been stiff. After carrying her upstairs, he placed her down, and I'll let Linda Arndt explain what happened next. I see John Ramsey carrying Jean Bonnet up the last three steps from the basement. And Jean Bonnet was clearly dead. Then she's been dead for a while. I ordered him to put John Bonnet down. It's reported Patsy then sprawled all over John Bonnet. You do not have to be a detective to understand that all this tomfoolery has completely ruined the crime scene. Some say that was the point, but I'll discuss that in a minute. The Denver police and the FBI help, well, they at least offer to, but alas, the crime goes unsolved. John Bonnet Ramsey was abducted, but not abducted, but definitely murdered in her own home. We spoke a little bit about the weird ransom note earlier, but I want to talk about that in further detail because it is one of the strangest parts of this crime. If you get rid of the ransom note, this isn't an abduction, this is this is the murder. Usually, if you're going to leave a ransom note, it's pretty short, pretty concise, doesn't give too much away, just the bare minimum detail. Okay, this is a blank piece of paper and I'm going to write a ransom note to let you guys know exactly how long a ransom note should take and what one should look like. I have your daughter. One million pounds for her return. No police or she dies. 16, 17. 17 words. There's also the mention of a foreign faction, which obviously rings bells as terrorism. Terrorism and FBI go hand in hand, so I'm not quite sure as to why they didn't claim jurisdiction, especially seeing as it was a kidnapping, which could have gone over state lines, aka the police had nothing to do with it. It should have been the FBI. I know what you're thinking. This wasn't an abduction. This was just a straight murder. It would have sounded that simple if there wasn't the ransom note. Why would there be a ransom note left for a child that's been killed and put in a cellar? Further inspection of the ransom note would reveal that it was in fact written on a pad of paper found inside the Ramsey's home. Patsy Ramsey's pen and piece of paper was used to make the ransom note. In fact, when they found the aforementioned notepad, several pages had been ripped out removed. And because the note was written in Sharpie, some of the pen had leaked through to a former page. So the police could clearly see that the note had not only been written in this pad, it had been drafted in this pad. A previous version of the note existed, starting Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey. The ransom note was also tested for fingerprints, however, nothing conclusive was found. As I mentioned earlier, Access Graphics in 91 was sold to Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin are a technology company and they produce war weapons. And they also have links to the MK Ultra program. There are so many resources online if you would like to read more about MK Ultra, but essentially they conducted experiments to make people turn into sex slaves and undercover assassins and loads of weird psychological bizarre shit. People have theorised that John Bonnet Ramsey was being, for want of a better word, turned into a sex slave via a stun gun. And apparently there was a book found in John Ramsey's office depicting how exactly you can make a stun gun sex slave. More often than not, when a child is found dead in their own home, it is as a result of somebody inside that house, whether it be a family member, a friend, killing them. Another statistical probability is the likelihood of sexual abuse. I had to find out for myself whether or not John Bonnet Ramsey was sexually abused. And the conclusion was, although there was no consistent sexual abuse, something may have happened leading up to the night of her murder. The autopsy also lists the damage done by the garrote used around John Bonnet's neck. When John Bonnet was found, she had a garrote around her neck and her wrists were tied. A garrote, if you do not know, is a ligature made out of some type of rope or twine used to strangle somebody and control them. If you can't comprehend exactly what a garrote is, then don't worry, I couldn't either, so... I've made one. This is Kelly. Actually, if you know Kelly, she usually lives in that corner and I've brought her out for one day and one day only. I've decided that it would be a great idea to demonstrate a garrote killing on Kelly using an aux cord. The pulling and twisting of a garrote will cause the strangulation and choking. Around here was completely caved in. Due to there being no distinct clarification as to whether it was a bashing or a strangulation that caused the death, people theorise that it may have been a sex game gone wrong. 
The house was searched for a potential murder weapon. What could possibly have caused the blunt force trauma? The only thing that could be found was a flashlight. It was a metal, heavy duty flashlight. I know this type of flashlight all too well. When I was younger, probably about Bert's age, nine years old, my little brother, he must have been about six or seven, him and I were playing around in the kitchen during a blackout. We were flashing around torches and I think we were hide and seeking. In the darkness and as an accident, I don't truly understand the weight of this flashlight. And I accidentally twats my brother across the face splitting his eye open. So I know exactly how heavy these flashlights can be in, that they can split skin and they can definitely smash bone. However, the flashlight was test for prints and there were none. The batteries as well had no fingerprints. All these little things result in a public opinion split two ways. One, it was an inside job caused by someone inside the family. Or two, it was an intruder. To those of you who may want to ask, let me address very directly, I did not kill my daughter John Bonet. Another strange autopsy finding and piece of evidence that people don't quite understand was the pineapple found in John Bonet's stomach. The autopsy revealed that John Bonet Ramsey had pieces of fleshy fruit like pineapple, grapes, inside her lower digestive tract. The finding of the food means John Bonet must have had fruit hours before she was found dead because the body didn't have time to fully process it. However, when her parents were questioned on this... I did not feed her pineapple when we returned home from the White's house. She was sound asleep, she was put in her bed, and tucked in goodnight. As you can see, pineapple and milk, which is kind of weird, was found and shown in the crime scene photos from that day. When tested, there were only two sets of fingerprints on that bowl. One was Patsy Ramsey, second was Burke. Burke Ramsey, nine years old at the time of his sister's death, was sleeping throughout the whole ordeal. However, internet users have theorized that perhaps Burke was related to the incident. This has been fueled by interviews made by Burke when he was a child and when he was an adult. He was interviewed by the detectives at Boulder Police Station and questioned about the pineapple bowl. I'll put the clip here. What about Christmas Eve? When you were going up there, did you guys have a snack before you went to bed that night? I forget. In 2016, Burke featured on the Dr. Phil show, where he had his first public interview and ousted his anonymity as an adult. I think it's fair to say he didn't come across well in the interview. He was smiling throughout, but perhaps that was nervousness. I remember the casket was small and her eyes were closed. I think one of her eyes was a little bit like droopy or something. I thought that was weird. How did you feel seeing her? A lot of sadness. I don't think I really fully grasped. Like, after this, I won't see her again. I can imagine Burke being starved of attention a little bit and growing to resent his sister. My family have had to deal with the fact that I'm the internet superstar and I can imagine that's not very easy for them. A potential timeline that has been put forward, John Bonet is put to bed and then she goes downstairs perhaps to make herself a snack. On going downstairs she finds Burke at the dining room table eating some pineapple and milk which his mother had made for him. Little John Bonet potentially walking past grabs a piece of pineapple from the bowl wouldn't be unlikely, that's the kind of thing that children do and that would be why there's no fingerprints on the bowl. After eating the pineapple, and that's why it's in her stomach, Bert gets pissed off, grabs a flashlight, twats her over the back of the head, causing the trauma. John Bonet falls to the floor. Bert gets scared, goes back upstairs. He's only nine, goes underneath his duvet and just waits for this bad dream to end. Patsy then comes downstairs in the morning to make her coffee where she finds John Bonet alerting her husband they do the biggest cover-up of the century. Whilst Patsy is writing the ransom note, John takes John Bonet into the cellar downstairs where he ties her up. This is where she wakes up and he has to choke her to death for real. I want to quickly take you back to the 911 call that I showed you at the beginning of the video and I want to play you the last couple of seconds. You're going to hear Patsy Ramsey disconnect the call and then you're going to hear some words. I'm not sure what those words say, however after audio analysis it has been suggested that it is actually a conversation between Patsy and Burke and John Ramsey. Patsy? Patsy? This would obviously go hand in hand with the Burke did it theory. They come downstairs, they find John Bonet's body, Burke says, oh, what's this? And they say, well, we know what the fuck you did. Go upstairs now. Forget this from your brain. You are only child. We're not having you taken away from us. Another theory is that an intruder did it. Somebody came into the house, which is a likely theory due to the fact that if you remember the scream that was heard at 2 a.m., do you remember the sound of metal on concrete after? It's similar to the sound of the grate closing outside the broken window leading up from the basement. This leads me to theorize that perhaps this was used as an exit point little after 2 a.m. 
where John Bonet was killed, hence the scream. I know what you're thinking. Surely, if there was a giant scream from John Bonet in the basement where she was killed, her parents upstairs would have heard her. Because of the positioning of the basement and the way that the vent shaft was leading from the basement to the outside world, a test was performed and it showed that if a scream came from that bedroom, it would be heard more clearly next door than it would be two floors up, three floors up in her parents' bedroom. It is not unlikely that John Bonet was taken from her bedroom into that cellar, killed, scream, great, go. However, this idea is contradicted by crime scene photos as there are cobwebs shown going across the window. Those cobwebs should have been disturbed if somebody was using it to get in and out. For a lot of people, the idea of an intruder and the ransom note being written inside the house doesn't really add up, but to me it kind of does. If I break into somebody's house with the intention of abduction and I am caught with a massive note saying that I'm going to take a child and then hold her hostage for loads of money, you're going to be facing a much harsher punishment than if you simply broke into the house and weren't discovered with all these objects. An intruder could easily broken in from 5 p.m. They could have stayed anywhere in the house. It was huge. John Mark Carr confessed to the killing of John Benet Ramsey. He said he was present, he knew exactly what had happened to her, and he knew why he did it. He said he was sick in the head and he just really wanted to have sex with a bunch of kids. Ever see the Ramsey home? In Boulder, mm -hmm. of course. How do you happen to see it? I've just seen it on several occasions. It's, uh, Physically, not just on TV or oh, yes. you, you've been to the home. Of course, yes. However, DNA exonerates him and proves that his confession was completely false. John Mark Carr was not even in Boulder, Colorado at the time. However, he did have links to the area. The Ramseys were notoriously difficult to interview. They did do interviews with Barbara Walters. Why didn't you take a lie detector test? No one it's ever asked us. Really? To take a lie detector test. Police never asked you to take a lie detector no. test? No. One yeah. of the policemen that uh, investigated this murder, he said, if I were to ask you to take a lie detector test, what would you say? And I said, I would be offended. There is so much information that it almost seems like this case is never going to be solved. Recently, leaked documents from 99 show that an indictment was made against Patsy and John Ramsey for child neglect. The charges were essentially for putting John Bonet in a position where she could have been harmed knowingly. In 2008, Mary Lacey, the district attorney at the time of Boulder, Colorado, determined that the Ramseys should be exonerated, they shouldn't be convicted, and they should not have any prejudice against their name. She formally apologised, but it was probably a bit too late, as two years previously, Patsy Ramsey had died. As shown in the Madeleine McCann case, any investigation that starts poorly usually ends with no conviction. The five main detectives on this case all have theories of their own, and now the gag goal orders have been lifted, they are free to say what they want. Detectives Whitson and Smith think it was an intruder. Detective Thomas thinks it was Patsy. Cola thinks it's Burke. And Detective Linda Arndt, she thinks it was John. Sadly, I don't see this case coming to a resolution anytime soon. However, I will keep my eye out and if anything new updates, I'll let you guys know. Just like Madeline McCann, whose case has reportedly been given an extra on £150,000 of public money. I propose that I have the £150,000 in small denominations, which I will then use as toilet paper for the foreseeable because that will probably have more fucking use. Let me know down in the comments below how you would waste £150,000 and who you think is guilty of the death of John Bonet Ramsey. I'm sure you've got loads of theories, thoughts and facts and I'm sure that I've missed a bunch of stuff out, probably intentionally because a lot of it was kind of gross. Thank you for watching, I love you and goodbye.